Thank you, Bernardo. And it, I'm very humbled with that introduction, so thank you very much. <laughs> and I actually do want to follow Pete's original brief of sharing some of the lessons learned or the failures achieved. And I actually was one of the people that told Pete, I do not want to talk about failure. <laughs> and then a good friend of mine who is also here, uh, Marco, rephrased it. He said, well, actually, if you break down the word fail, it's the first attempt in learning. And I thought, oh, I like that. <laughs> so I can work with that. Oh, and by the way, the, the song I had for the intro, which didn't make it here, I'll tweet. It's made by a good friend of mine in Ireland. She sings on the Blizzard game, uh, World of Warcraft, the new one, Legions just about when the hero is about to die. And I thought it was the most amazing, it's the most amazing haunting voice. She's an awesome, awesome voice. Nella is the name, so <laughs> if you at Nella, I think she is. Uh, so find her, but I'll tweet the actual song later. It's awesome, it just, it gives me the goosebumps. And I wanted to give them to you, but so first attempt in learning, right? <laughs> So let's let's dive in. Ah. <laughs> Oops. We go quickly. <laughs> okay, so the first thing I tend to do, I learn from failure, but I don't dwell on failure. It happens a lot. We've done about 70 odd projects since starting the company Gamification Nation in 2012, and there's been lots and lots of lessons. So all the design frameworks I share are based on experience I've had that I do not want to repeat. So, and I would say, I suggest the same to you. If you're struggling with something, just build a framework so it doesn't have to happen again. It's what a good base is founded on for everything. And I think most of our projects are in learning, so I'd be daft not to make a good base for future learning, right? So, the first uh, projects that I want to share and talk about without naming them and shaming them was a sort of set in an academic atmosphere. So we had academic partners, we had um, regular partners, <laughs> and they wanted a game or a competition or a massive online open course only it was never 100% clear what it was. And the first thing I suppose every good learning project needs is learning objectives, business objectives. So coming from the very commercial world, I sort of went, but, but what's our point? Where are we going with this? What is it? And actually it became really hard to sell and really hard to design for because what's the narrative? Are people competing or are they taking a course? So clarity was completely lacking and completely missing, but we needed it. And surprise, surprise, the project flopped. <laughs> and at hindsight, they said, yeah, we should have listened. I'm like, great, <laughs> that's fantastic. But I mean, it was confusing to me as a designer but it was even more confusing to the learners because they didn't know where to go, whether they were playing, whether they were submitting. I had created a narrative to the game, but comedy of errors, this was a project with multiple layers of errors. We had multiple providers working together. A gamification platform that wasn't allowed to implement gamification but the Indian owners of the LMS were. Only every time they said yes, it really meant, no, we didn't do it. So it, it was one of the most stressful experiences, but clarity was the key to the failure of the actual project, uh, in my view, because we hadn't enough participants. Why? Because they didn't know what they were enrolling themselves for. They didn't know if they were learning or competing. 
And reality was, there was a, an awesome prize at the end. They should have just called it a competition. But hey. <laughs> so you live and learn. It was the, the, academics, the academic side that actually insisted on making it a MOOC. All the commercial people were in it for the competition. So please, academia, I love you, but <laughs> you know, <laughs> let it call a spade a spade. Now, designing a gamified learning experience requires inclusive design. One of the things I learned very early on is if you're going to design gamification and points badges on leaderboards, they do have their place, but they're not a one size fits all. If you want gamification design to work, you need to ask your users to get involved. I think Sylvester put it really well this, so far already. Co-create, get people involved, get them stuck in. Ask them what works for them. What motivates them, what makes them think. Why do they learn? Because if you don't answer that question, how are you going to start? Where do you start? Right? So that was my, my second big lesson. Um, and I suppose it's one that I came with because a lot of the gamification designs I saw on the market actually came with very competitive designs. And I can compete like the rest of you, but only if I have a sense that I have a chance to win. I don't like competition for competition's sake. And that is actually a very feminine trait. And what I saw on the market didn't appeal to me. But then I was also never asked. So, <laughs> which was interesting. Um, the other one uh, that I build into uh, to everything that I do now is to start mentioning that we're going to iterate the design. Because on the very first projects I did, that came at the end. And at that point, the, cl the client starts to question you, going, do you not know what you're doing? Did you not get it right first time? And you know, some of the things you can only find out once people start playing with your design, once people start using it and you see feedback. In fact, feedback with data, most powerful feedback you can get. So that's what I'm looking for. But I started telling them at the pitch, it's in every deck I do, in every presentation, in every proposal, that we are going to iterate the design. That yes, we will come up with our best guess, but it may change. And it may change several times over a time period of use because keeping it fresh is also essential. And to imagine that you can get it right first time and forever, I'll tell you something. You're magicians if you can promise that. I can't. Hands up. Guilty can't do it. So this is where the design process comes from for Gamification Nation. So looking at those um, couple of lessons, that's why I insist on these three steps. If we do not get to go to KPIs, cultures, business objectives, learning objectives, we don't start. But we also don't start if we're not allowed to do user research. And if there are issues around iterations, I also question how committed are you to really getting it right? So that's the reason for that framework. <laughs> you want to take a photo? It comes with sound effects, that's awesome. <laughs> a camera that comes with sound effects. So <laughs> I've had my battles with clients. <laughs> I've had my battles with suppliers. On occasion, it's the most important battle or the thing to do when you're heading towards battle mode is to focus on the end user. Typically, I get battles by the time we go to the first version or the first uh, draft of a gamification design. Because then somebody starts piping up, but why don't we have a leaderboard? Or where's my badges? You'll have them. <laughs> They're there. <laughs> they exist. So 
I usually say, well, actually, user research tells us here's where we found exactly the reason why we didn't use that specific game mechanic. And that's usually a very good reference point. I had it recently on a project where we're designing a virtual world for a charity. And they said, oh, but we wanted a virtual world in 3D and everything. We had done user research. And actually, the users only use mobile devices to access the internet. I don't know if you've ever tried downloading a virtual world onto your mobile phone or your iPad. But as far as I could see, it wasn't workable. So we're making it 2D web-based. So again, that is something you wouldn't be able to argue unless you did use research. So that was an important lesson learned for us. Now, <laughs> this one I have on a regular basis. The next button <laughs> in e-learning is not a gamified element. <laughs> you know, it really isn't. You know, most of the time in e-learning, interaction is that. You press next, you press next. Now, I worked as a learning and development manager, which is why we do mostly learning gamification. And, you know, <laughs> one of the things that we did for compliance training is we did races on how to get finished quickest around compliance. And it was somebody at the end of the open plan training with a stopwatch saying, go. And then we all just click next, like crazy. How effective. Nobody, but nobody remembered anything from that training. So learning gamification doesn't have to be a competition, but it's also not the next button. Do make it first person. So in most uh, situations when you're playing a game, you're in the first person. You're the player. You're not just a button clicker. And that's, that's really key. It doesn't have to be a competition. I mean, World of, War, uh, World, of War, <laughs> World of Minecraft, I meant to say, is very creative, very educational, but not a competition. You're making stuff. Why not let them make stuff in their learning? Yeah, I think I mentioned that. Right first time and forever. Same illusion as one size fits all. We, in all of our gamification designs for learning, have multiple learner journeys. In, we worked with um, Adidas. We had six different learner journeys. Why? Because we identified in the user research that there was very distinct audiences with very distinct different needs. So you make six, difference, six different ones. The gameplay and the game mechanics can return. <coughs> But the story that you tell for people to get there is different. So this is where my learning gamification framework comes in. Level one is the content. Make it first person, quest based. If, if you're really lazy and you only ever do one thing, build a quest for content. But I like it to be scenario based, snack sized. Snack sized means if you can eat a snack, and that's the length of time it takes. That's how long your learning should be. Don't make it massive amounts. People don't do that anymore. Choices, mini games, consequences. The amount of times I have to argue with L&D departments to put in consequences and feedback is quite frightening. People don't like their people to experience failure. Funny that. Yet, most of us have learned from failure more than we have learned from our successes. Some of us don't know how we got successful in the first place. But we do know why we failed, because we've probably sat on that for a while. The second part is systems gamification. The LMS people have caught on that, yes, gamification is a thing. So let's put points, badges, leaderboards, and if you're lucky, a few other elements. But that's not the end of it. It provides context. It provides structure. It does help, but think it through. And don't switch it on for everything and everyone. I think it gives learning structure. It shows progression. 
It should tell you how much your skills are improving and where possible, make it fun, which is not always possible. It's not ha-ha fun like a comedy, but more, I'm enjoying this process. So, now I also felt in learning gamification, we were missing a trick, a more than one big trick. In fact, we're not looking for proof enough. So that's why in my framework, in comparison to Carl Kapp and others on the market, I added level three, and that is all about proof. What's important to the corporate buyer? They have proof that people have mastered the skill. What's important to the learner? They have proof that they've mastered the skill. And they can then go out for a new job, promotion, whatever the case may be. So that's the trick we were all missing. And this is where I feel future technology has an amazing place to play. So now I've built up sort of the base level of proof. First level of proof is you can fill in the evaluation form. That's your happy sheet. <laughs> the second level of proof is actually somebody can self-report that, you know what, I finished this course and I loved it. Then you get a quality rating by somebody else you know that person has really implemented that skill and they're good at it. Then you can do the full 360, not just one, but multiples. You can train somebody else, you can mentor somebody else, and ultimately you can publish or give expert advice. Not everybody will want to go through the whole thing, but a lot of people will want to go through some of these. And learning in the end of the day is to satisfy some need or other. So what's the future, in my view, in terms of education and learning and gamification, is we'll need to teach people to work together with artificial intelligence. I think artificial intelligence will take over some of our jobs, but we still need to train those artificially intelligent systems. And I think gamification actually can help you do that. Good game design can teach your bots to be better. Good feedback loops can make your systems more responsive to you, to your questions, to your designs. And it should be adaptive. Now, adaptive in learning has been a thing already. In gamification, I haven't seen it yet. But it should be there. Because what I respond to, and what you respond to, and you respond to, and you respond to, will be completely different, and that's okay. You should design for it. The one part that gets me totally excited is blockchains, <laughs> because I do think that's where my level three gamification of proof will really be put to the test. So imagine you finish your course on a specific topic, you get the certification, and then you put those skills into practice. People that have done the course or have that skill can confirm, you know what, you exemplary implemented that skill. And they then create a time-stamped reference, you know what, you're good at this. Now, if you're an organization and you want a snapshot of where the competencies lie within your organization, those timestamps and those skill sets all of a sudden become super interesting. If you're looking for a new job and you have a little passport with your competency levels and timestamps and recognition from recognized experts, how cool would that be? So that's why I'm a little bit excited about that technology. <laughs> so my top tips, if you're gonna do learning gamification, and you're just starting out, my learning gamification framework is a good start. It's the reason why I built it is because I learned from what didn't work. Balancing your design is a consistent balancing act. It's like walking a tightrope. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Feedback tells you iterate until it sticks. Communication is key for buy-in and for acceptance. 
and you never do enough of it. <laughs> if you think you're doing okay, check again. And you will become better when you do more and more designs. It's how we've iterated. Some of our early things were, today I would cringe if I put it out. <laughs> but that's the way we learn. And that's the way we all should think about it. So start where you are, do what you can with what you have. And that's all. <laughs>